It seems that we can't get away from all the cultural noise regarding issues of sexuality and gender. Sex education is coming fast and furious at our kids at younger and younger ages. This means it's more important than ever that we speak and keep speaking about sex and gender from a biblical perspective. And we must start to share God's truth with even our preschool children. What should we be teaching them about sex and gender? Stick with us as I chat with a group of parents and youth workers about 10 truths from God's Word on sex and gender that home and church must be teaching kids on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Welcome to this podcast episode of Youth Culture Matters. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor of student ministry at Old North Church in Canfield, Ohio. Normally, uh, I am the host of uh, the Word in Youth Ministry, which is one of our other three of our total of three podcasts of the of the CPYU Podcast Network. But today, I'm here on Youth Culture Matters because we're talking about an exciting resource that the Center for Parent Youth Understanding put out a few months ago called God's Plan for Sex and Gender: Ten Teaching Points for Home and church. And today we're going to be asking Dr. Walt Mueller questions about this document and thinking through this. So Walt, I just want to welcome you to this episode of the podcast. Oh, it's great to be on here. I've listened to over 150 episodes. They're awesome. Uh, Walt, and I'm just, as we think about recording this and we think about the history of CPYU, um, it's in our name, the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. We want to help educate and equip parents um, to better raise their kids in the ways of the Lord. Uh, when we think about the title of this resource that you put together, God's Plan for Sex and Gender, 10 Teaching Points for Home and Church, I was just curious if you can just uh, take us behind the scenes a little bit before we get started here to know a little bit about the why behind making this document in this season. Yeah, I you know, I think a lot about how when I was a kid, I learned about sex and gender, sexuality, you know, in youth group at home. And I think my story is probably typical of the stories of people my age and even younger because when I was doing youth ministry in the late 70s and the 80s, we struggled to teach well on this. And so, uh, you know, as I look back, I I say this a lot, you know, there's three words I use. I don't think when it comes to sex and gender in the church we've trusted well. I don't think we've uh, taught well, and I don't think we've treated well. You know, those three T's. Let me explain that. Um... The trust part is I don't think we've really trusted, really understood God's word on sex and gender and then trusted that enough to live into it. So, you know, I grew up, I had my teenage years during the sexual revolution of the 60s and the 70s, and certainly everything we're experiencing now is in the wake of that, you know, so so there were many who saw this, saw this coming. There are other changes as well. But I think the church has just not trusted well in terms of what God's word has to say on this. And then I don't think we've taught well either. I think in our youth groups, you know, a lot of times uh, we hear a lot. We actually had one of these podcast episodes, one of the one of the episodes uh, a ways back, where we talked to someone who had been raised in the quote unquote purity movement. And there's a lot of conversation now about how even with good intentions, that movement, the purity movement, really wasn't a good way to teach. And we learned some good things, but we also taught and learned some things that were not really that helpful, and we're learning that now. People can go back and listen to that particular episode. It was really helpful to hear that conversation. And I think many parents now, because we haven't been taught well, and youth workers, because we weren't taught well, we in turn don't know how to know how to teach. It wasn't modeled well for us. We weren't trained well. And then the treated part is, and we'll get into this a little more, I just think people who you know, fall outside of, let's say, God's borders and boundaries, you know, all kinds of different disordered desires and sexual sin, we tend to scandalize them and, and rank that as somehow worse than anything else. And, and I think sometimes we use that to diminish our sense of our own sin. And, and we haven't really done a good job of being uh, 
I'll use the cliche, you know, the hands and feet of Jesus and treating people with a good balance, a proper balance of grace and truth. So I figured, you know what, let's let's try to come up with something that would be helpful to people to know them what to teach and how to trust and even how to treat others who were struggling with these things. And even ourselves, you know, as we as we deal with all this, we'll get into this, you know, this is an issue for all of us uh, on a very personal level inside of ourselves. And so I think looking at it in, in this way is, is probably, hopefully, very helpful. Yeah, so we're so thankful. Um, thanks for sharing that, Walt, because I think sometimes we can just read documents or resources, um, but we see, we see them at a surface level when it's helpful to know um, even what you just said there about, um, you know, a lot of times parents are teaching kids in the same way that they were they were taught from their parents. And what we see is just generational um, generational patterns. And what we're trying to do with this document is say, I mean, it starts in the very beginning. Uh, it says, our children and teens are being educated on matters of sex and gender by a current cultural narrative that engages in 24-7 messaging, even to children as young as preschool age. Oh, and yeah. so what we're trying to do is we're trying to help educate parents um, and youth workers so that they can, um, in turn, break that generational pattern that's going in the wrong direction. You know, Kyle, one thing I want to say about that is, and we've said this before on the Youth Culture Matters podcast, uh, when we talk about matters of sexuality and gender, and that is sort of become a, a constant theme we keep repeating that whoever speaks first sets the bar for truth. And the culture right. is certainly talking to our kids at younger and younger ages. So, for example, and we've talked about this before, last year during Pride Month, uh, the word transgender came up in front of my then seven-year-old grandson. Mm -hmm. And he was you know, he was wondering what it was, and his dad said, <laughs> ask Papa. So I had the <laughs> wonderful opportunity to, to try to explain something that's very complex and tender and sensitive to a seven-year-old who had a hard time, you know, getting his head around it. But it has to happen because they're hearing these terms and they're encountering this, I think, long before they even get to school now. And this is one of the one of the ways that our culture has changed so much. So thus this document, you know, if we're going to teach, let's know at least on the start at a start, you know, what what can we teach? Yeah. And so in order uh, to dive deeper into this document on this episode, obviously in uh, the show notes to this episode, there'll be a link where you can go to cpyu.org. You can find a link um, to download this. And uh, what I like is it downloads in a PDF, so it's easy to print out. Um, but we have two other guests on this episode. Um, we have Lane, who is a mom and a youth worker in Ohio. And we have Jess, who is a youth worker in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, the three of us are going to be asking Walt questions about this document. But before we do, um, Lane, I figured we would start with you, um, both as a mother and as a volunteer youth worker. Um, when you read this document and just thinking through uh, what it's discussing, what are a few things that come to mind as we think about just our cultural landscape today? Uh, well, first of all, I loved this document. I thought it was so helpful for talking about with my kids um, I have three teenage boys and they have three completely different personalities. And I felt like these talking points hit some of their concerns and some of um, the ways that they tend to lean. I have one who's a strict rule follower and he tends to lean toward being very judgmental to anyone who might choose this lifestyle. Um, so I found that very helpful that that was addressed in there, that being gracious and um, giving dignity to um, even those who are making these choices. So I loved this, this, um, tool. I thought it was very helpful. And, you know, one of the big concerns that I have is how to even counsel our kids. Like, should we even be counseling our kids to engage in this? It's so frowned upon, especially in a public school setting, which my kids are in public school. Um, and a lot of our youth group kids are in the public school setting. So, you know, should we be counseling them and how do we counsel them how to even engage in these conversation, especially when they can be um, targeted even by teachers and staff as, as bullying behavior, if they're simply stating what they, you know, what their, the truth is. Um, so that's, it's kind of just a broad question. It's not very specific, but, and I know even from my teen's perspective, their natural inclination is to avoid topics like this. They don't want to yeah. engage in this kind of stuff. They want to just like stay in the shadows and not have to, to battle that at all. So how can we encourage them and how can we um, counsel them to even engage in these conversations? Yeah, that's helpful. And I think that even if we just ended this podcast episode right now, I think that what you just said would be enough encouragement uh, to have someone go on the website and download this, because I think it's right, as you said about your kids having different personalities, um, helping them think similarly 
um, even from different perspectives is helpful. Um, and we also have Jess, who is a youth worker. She was on a few other um, episodes we had when we had a panel of youth workers here on Youth Culture Matters. Uh, she, Jess, you're in British Columbia, Canada. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you're working at a church uh, and you're uh, specifically with high school students. Uh, and so as you think through this document and kind of a little bit of what you're experiencing in your culture there, um, what are a few just general things that come to mind? Yeah, I've been in my particular role for upcoming to two years. So I'm still still getting to know the students that I'm working with. But over the last two years, more and more um, of our students have yet yeah, these conversations are coming up. Um, with students who are personally walking through feelings of gender dysphoria or same sex attraction um, with people who have close friends um, who are walking through that. And, and it's interesting because the majority of our students are Christian school kids who come to our youth group, um, but it's still becoming more and more prevalent that um, I had one student come up to me and said, well, everyone's non-binary in my grade. And this is like the big general statements, the fact that Yes, students in Christian and public schools are really wrestling with the truth and yeah, how to understand who God is and who I am and how to navigate feelings and all of that. Um, and so I think my big overarching concern or something that's come up over and over again that I think this article also speaks to is how to determine how to determine what is loving and what is not. Um, I think this statement of God is love is becoming so much louder within our Christian circles, um, which is true. God is love, but what does it look like if you're trying to love someone um, and they don't feel loved and that whole idea, I think that is a really sensitive thing. It's something that can be really um, yeah, misunderstood of what it means that God is truly loving. So I'm excited to talk more about it. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of students are finding themselves. And what you just said about these these large statements that the teenagers are making, everyone is fill in the blank. All of my friends are fill in the blank. Uh, it's super hard when we think about um, how complicated these issues can be in our culture that we exist in. Uh, so Jess, Lane, and I are going to put Walt on the hot seat here, and I'm going to start. Um, Walt, I think my favorite thing about this document uh, when I sent it out to my youth workers, because uh, I taught through several of these points to my youth group about two months ago, um, is actually in the second paragraph, uh, you you allude to something Paul Tripp said. You said, uh, Paul Tripp has said that the Bible's four most important words about sex and gender are these, in the beginning, God. And so it's interesting, Walt, because you, you just said that whoever talks first uh, owns the conversation. And here we see that what does God do, right? He talks first, right, um, in the word. And um, so I was just wondering if you can help our listeners think through why what Paul Tripp said is true. Why are the four most important words about sex and gender in the beginning God? Yeah, well, I mean, the simple answer is he's the maker of it all, right? So if we, if we think about uh, God as creator and we understand that he has made all things and declared all things good, there's also a purpose and a plan. If he's a designer, there's obviously a design, and we want to understand the design. Uh, and leave it to Paul Tripp, right, to say the best best thing. When I heard him, I, I had listened to him speak to students at Wheaton uh, College. Uh, he spoke, I, I believe, in a convocation or a chapel, and I, I watched this on YouTube, and I just thought what he said was so brilliant because so much of the misunderstandings that we now have in the church and the and and the disagreements and even the arguments that are taking place and Kyle we've talked about this we've watched some of this start to unfold during Pride Month right on some of the youth mm -hmm. ministry groups on Facebook where you know people are you know touting being affirming and some obviously are not trying to lean more into uh, what we would understand to be uh, traditional biblical sexuality that when I've read, and, and I try to read as widely as I can, but when I've read the books by those who are promoting an affirming stance, an affirmative stance, one of the things that became clear to me pretty quickly was they were not going back to Genesis. They would do all sorts of hermeneutical and exegetical gymnastics on other passages, some of them more obscure, and maybe even just arguing over one or two words in the New Testament to kind of shift from a traditional you know, 2,000-year understanding of uh, what biblical sexuality is to more of an allowance for, in some cases, just monogamous same-sex relationships mm -hmm. or even more so, you know, no borders and boundaries at all. And I don't know how we can talk about anything in, the, in God's world without going back to Genesis, because in Genesis, that's the way, thing, that's the way things are supposed to be. 
So prior to the fall, we see what God's good design is. And I know, Kyle, uh, you've talked on the Word and Youth Ministry. You folks have walked through creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And that really is important for us to understand because I don't believe we can understand sexuality and gender and teach on it and live into it according to God's good design and plan unless we see you know, those chapters in God's story, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, which leads me to in that same paragraph you note there, once I heard Paul Tripp say that, and I'm thinking about our world and our culture, you know, that we've been watching here at CPYU for 33 years, I thought, you know, those were God's first four words, but then let's go to, in Genesis 3, 1, the first four words spoken by the enemy of God who wants to undo everything good that God made, and that would be Satan, right, the wrecker of this world. His first four words come in the form of a question, and, they, and it, it goes like this, did God really say? And it was trying to get our first parents to doubt God's good order and design. And as I think about that in my life, that's the whisper I hear constantly, not just on sexuality and gender, but on just about anything. And, and so I think just getting that context right out of the gate is really, really important because we see where sex and gender can fit into God's plan. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's super helpful as we uh, start this conversation, as we're looking at uh, this resource that Walt wrote, God's Plan for Sex and Gender, 10 Teaching Points for Home and Church. Uh, We just got Walt on the hot seat. We barely started. We're going to take a break. And then when we come back, Lane and Jess are going to ask him a few questions. I often hear grandparents say how glad they are that they don't have to raise kids in today's world. While these comments might not be very encouraging to those of us who are parents or who are doing youth ministry with kids today, they do recognize the fact that there are lots of confusing and dangerous cultural realities that kids need to navigate if they are going to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. In an effort to provide parents and youth workers with an easy-to-use tool designed to help kids find their way through the choices they face in today's world, I've written a new little book that can be used individually or in small groups, A Student's Guide to Navigating Culture. It's the shortest book I've ever written, but it's the one I believe will have the greatest impact in terms of discipling the emerging generations. If you want to teach your kids how to live in today's culture while following God's will and way, check out this new little book, A Student's Guide to Navigating Culture. You can learn more and order copies at cpyu.org. And we're back on uh, Youth Culture Matters, and we're talking about God's plan for sex and gender, 10 teaching points for home and church. And Lane and Jess and I, we uh, just started by asking Walt questions, and uh, there's 10 points here. Um, that uh, Walt has put together. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's a great resource for those of you who are listening, who are either youth workers or parents. Um, I use this resource two different ways. Um, I was meeting a student for discipleship every Monday uh, at uh, Panera. We would meet and um, do Bible reading and book discussions, and we just walked down point by point. Um, But another thing is I use it to teach our students, and I didn't necessarily go point by point, but because this is so concise, it is helpful. It's a helpful resource to teach, um, to teach teenagers. So uh, we're going to go down through here, the 10 different points. And uh, we're going to start here with point number one, which is God is our loving authority on sex and gender. God is our loving authority on sex and gender. And Jess has a question for Walt on this one. Can I, before we get into that, can I, can I just uh, unpack that just a little bit? Because I think one of the reasons why we have to state this is in our culture right now, uh, and we've talked about this on past podcasts, you know, this whole idea of expressive individualism, that I just need to be authentic to myself. That's really rooted in um, a desire to live out of my emotions and my feelings as opposed to, you know, uh, some sort of transcendent authority outside of myself that I'm supposed to live by. For the Christian, we understand that to be God's Word. And so I, I started with this for the simple reason that we've got a whole generation of young people, and either, even many parents right now, the culture's really leaning in this direction, that it's all about, you know, you do you and follow your heart, as opposed to, 
uh, there is an authority outside of yourself. So, so for followers of God, you know, we, we recognize that this is what God has given us as our rule for faith and our rule for life. This is where we learn God's, not only God's plan and God's design, but his will and his way for our lives personally. You know, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that our hearts are just deceitful. And I think it's scary to live out of following your heart uh, because your heart's not trustworthy. And so that's why I wanted to start with this, you know, that we we do have an authority, a foundation on which to build. Yeah, so Jess, why don't you ask Walt your question? So on this topic of talking about God as our loving authority, um, that means that we would hold Scripture as our authority of, um, yeah, the way of life. Um, So one thing, a couple of questions that students have asked me before is that why do we consider the Bible to be authoritative? And if we have progressed culturally since the Bible times, shouldn't we allow like our biblical interpretation to just match that our current uh, cultural climate? So I'd love to hear your thoughts. on Yeah. That. Well, uh, let me start with this. I really think, and, and, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of churches, I just had a conversation with someone this morning, I was a guest on another podcast, and someone left their church because they're no longer leaning into the Bible. They mm-hmm. had, but they no longer are. And and I thought to myself, man, this is a, this is a cultural shift. And I think what's happened is we have uh, many, many leaders in the church who are not trained well enough, do not have a good uh, doctrine of Scripture. They haven't studied the Scriptures to understand what Scripture says about itself. And as a result, we really don't teach well that way. So now when we say, you know, we need to follow the scriptures, and I know teenagers are going to ask that all the time. You know, I, I just remember kids who towed the line the whole way through, and then all of a sudden they hit 15 or 16, and they're looking at me going, how, how do I know the Bible is true, right? And this is where I think we need to start to teach on uh, the doctrine of the authority of scripture, instill that in our kids. You know, so I, I would go immediately to... You know, when when Paul's uh, passing the baton on to Timothy, and I think about this in 2 Timothy 3, you know, some of the marching orders, the personal instructions that are there, and he even in that chapter, chapter 3 on, on godlessness in the last days when people will become, you know, followers of self and lovers of self and that sort of thing, which is really what's happening. One of the things that Paul says to end that, end that section is, is, you know, God has breathed out Scripture. This is where we find God's plan. It's God's Word. And at the end of that chapter, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, you know, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And I understand, you know, ultimately there is this battle that takes place, and we have to pray that our students will understand this uh, as God's Spirit ministers to them, and ultimately it is something that they will only accept by faith. And so I do think the battle is good, the conversation's good, and it's good to get there. The problem with the second part of your question that I see is that, uh, and again, Jess, you were part of these conversations on progressive Christianity that we move beyond Scripture being authoritative. We, we live, progressive Christianity lives into the self as sovereign, and the self is authoritative. And Jesus does not become the Word of God incarnate, nor is Jesus one that communicates God's Word, but Jesus is actually just an, an example for us, which then leads to, you know, a lot of the love is love type stuff, and, and we lean, as you said earlier, into more grace, uh, void of truth, which is really not truth at all. So, you know, it, you're asking a good question. It's a complex question. But I think that uh, as we talked on that podcast, you know, the, the progressing that needs to take place in our faith is one of sanctification as we grow into our knowledge of God and living and loving Jesus uh, by living out his will for our lives. It is not moving beyond uh, a theology that somehow we think is something less because people weren't that smart back then. We're much more we're much smarter and much more enlightened now. That's what progressive Christianity does and and I think it, it really does undermine what we were trying to communicate here. I don't know if I you, you may want to follow up Jess on that question because that is a big question. I don't know if I answered it well or not. Yeah, I think that's a great comment of um, so often we see that like, oh, we have more knowledge now, or we're more aware of the social movements, or 
the cultural climate. But reading through the New Testament, like the author spoke very directly to situations that we're still in, uh, encountering now. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a great point. And it is a point of pride, right? If yeah. You think that we're better than Paul or Timothy or um, other biblical authors. So, yeah. Good. And, and, you know, Jess, I think I think one of the things that's important, you know, when, when we go back to what we mentioned earlier about Genesis 3-1, you know, where the enemy comes in and says, did God really say? Um, I think that many of us have no idea what God has really said. And that's re- really where we have to start. And we trust the Holy Spirit to bring about a re- his promised return on uh, the teaching that we do, the proclamation of God's Word. And so I, I find that a lot of people who will say, you know, say, th- and you, you'll have kids like this, you know, like, well, God's anti-sex or, you know, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. And they've never read it. They just don't understand it. And and so I think for us to teach from that is uh, is important. Well, thanks for how you answered that question, because I think for our listeners, especially if they've been tracking along with different episodes that have been coming out here on Youth Culture Matters, uh, as you mentioned, progressive Christianity, so often in our culture, we're trying to progress forward. But what you're stating here in number one is we're actually looking back at what God did in the very beginning. And so our students who are trained by messaging, who are trained by advertising, who are trained by their teachers to always be looking forward. Here we are as parents and as youth workers by training them to look back at what God has said already. And that's an encouragement to me personally. Yeah, just one uh, statement at the end there, Kyle, that that, I'm, I'm, that I wrote in there is, you know, we have to judge our feelings by Scripture, put them under the authority of that rather than judging Scripture by, uh, by our feelings. Yeah, and that's something that's that's pretty countercultural um, in our teenage landscape today. So we're going to move on here to the second one, which is all people are made by God in His image. So we're moving beyond God. Uh, we're moving to step two. So not just that God is um, the loving authority, but now that God in creation, Genesis two and three, or uh, one and two, leading before the fall and three, that all people are made by God in His image. And Lane has a question for you on this one. Yeah, this is the point that really kind of grabbed me. I love that this was the second point because I think our kids are so inundated with a lot of this stuff that we expend a lot of effort um, trying to convince them of the biblical truth and and what God has to say about it. And sometimes I'm afraid we forget to remind them that everyone has that dignity and that worth and everyone is created in God's image. So I I love that this was the second point in this tool here. Um, So I guess my question for this is, for many individuals who identify, you know, as LBGTQ, identify with that community, that identity is so wrapped up in their sense of self. It is so much a part of them that I think they would have a hard time understanding how someone could love them or care about them and not accept or promote that lifestyle. So how would you, uh, what would you say to a teen who was being challenged on this? Uh, a teen who's being challenged in terms of this is their lifestyle or... Being challenged on, you can't care about, you can't say you care about me if you're not promote, you know, if you don't agree with this lifestyle, if you're saying that I'm wrong, that's who I am. So you can't possibly care about me. If that's what we're going to counsel our yeah. kids to care about people, how would you answer them, you know, on that point? Yeah. Well, my understanding of that is, and and I've seen this happen and, and I've lived into this myself, and that is that people expect us because we are Christians to not care, they expect us to condemn, and it's an absolute surprise when we tend to, to love and care as Jesus is loved and cared. And I think just fostering a relationship is a big deal. You know, I may not agree uh, in terms of my base, basic foundational worldview, if it's a biblical worldview, that you're choosing to live a lifestyle that is pleasing to God, but that does not mean that I cannot you know, I cannot engage with you. And I, and I do think, too, Lane, that, that there's a difference between those who are, you know, really ignorant as to God's will and way, who are living outside of, you know, confessing or professing faith in Jesus Christ and, and you know, choosing to live this way, and those who are professing to live, uh, uh, you know, a Christian life but choosing to live outside of God's will and way in terms of sexuality, and that, that can be any kind of sexual sin, right? Um, and, and there's all kinds. And, you know, for those who are in Christ, we have a responsibility, and we're told this, to uh, 
you know, I, I, I hate to use the word confront because I think that gets a bad rap now, but I think we need to, you know, use whatever whatever tools we have within the body of Christ to to confront that person and and for their good and for God's glory lead them back into a lifestyle that conforms in obedience to God's will and way. This is what church discipline is, right? And I think it, it's been lost. You know, the three marks of the church, a true church, uh, the preaching of God's word, the, the uh, administration of the sacraments, and the third thing, which which in many churches is not even it's not even practiced or seen as a possibility. It's seen as something negative is church discipline. And, and discipline is always about correction. And so, you know, I think, too, that we have to understand that we don't want to paint ourselves in a corner by leaning into the relationship so much that we never speak the truth. I think to speak the truth, we have to do it in love. I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I've had those situations with people, and, and people have had those situations with me. And, and so I think that's where uh, it's really important to, to, to engage in relationships so that we have that permission and that ability to do that. I'm not walking away from you. You know, that's, that's how it is. I, I, I love you, but I want to tell you the truth as well. Yeah, and that statement, uh, the statement of if you, if you tell that to your child or tell that to someone you love, um, a, a student in the youth group, uh, you're affirming your love for them, which is going exactly back uh, to how God loved Adam and Eve in the garden. Yeah. Um, and so I think I think that's helpful, and I think that um, it just reminds us of how messy this is, right? This is not the reason we need documents like this, and the reason why you know, one of the reasons we exist at CPYU is because uh, this is a messy culture that we live in, and we need help navigating it. You know, Kyle, human nature is to categorize people. We do that yeah. racially. We do that economically we do that geographically um you know there's a lot of bigotry out there and the same thing we label people who maybe are part of a group uh who have chosen to live a certain way and i I am i have to work through that in my life and so one of the mantras for me is when i look at someone and i tend to label i need to preach to myself that's a divine image bearer that's a divine image bearer and to do that just just instills in me a sense of the value of that individual, and it makes all the difference in the world. We need yeah. to train ourselves out of that. Yeah, that's a good word, and preaching to ourselves is one way that we can do that. Uh, so we're going to transition now to number three. Uh, number three says, God has given us his order and design for sex and gender at creation. God has given us his order and design for sex and gender at creation. And I think this is my favorite one out of the 10. Walt, and my question for you is, uh, you make a point here, um, how uh, what we see in Genesis 1 and 2 is also reflected in the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 19. Um, and I love just to see that connection, because some people would say, oh, back, you know, it, like someone who might not be a Christian would say, even if Adam and Eve existed, that was so long ago. Um, but because Jesus affirmed it, um, we have to not only worry about, oh, maybe if Adam and Eve existed, but if Jesus actually existed. So I was just wondering, um, your wording here in this point is that it is maintained consistently throughout the Bible. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that, to parents and youth workers, how you can help them think through how this sexual ethic is consistently given through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right. So you do see that people fall into sin, and there's some some heinous stuff that takes place, Right. And sexual sin comes in all kinds of ways. I mean, one of the primary places where we can learn about this is we go back to David, right, and his uh, sin with Bathsheba. I mean, and that was so multi-layered and multifaceted. And you you not only begin to understand, you know, how to how David lived out of God's plan, but what the results of that were in terms of the undoing of himself and the joy of his salvation, as we read in Psalm 51, is something that he prays and cries out fervently to have restored. He just came undone. You know, sin breaks our relationship with God, and so we need to understand that. And so throughout the Scriptures, you you, you will read this. But what, what one of the reasons why I mentioned Jesus is oftentimes people will say, well, you know, no, Jesus was all about love. We just need to love people, and the way to love them is let them do what they want to do. No. You know, Jesus, I mean, he, in that passage you mentioned there in Matthew 
19, I mean, he's talking about, you know, ha- have you not heard it was said? You know, basically, uh, it, he talks about gender. God created them male and female, and he's talking there in that, in that uh, particular context, um, a, a teaching about divorce, and so he's talking about marriage. So he's affirming um, the, the creational standards. And then the other thing is when you think about, you know, the woman caught in sin— and when he, how he, you know, cares for her and speaks to her and speaks to those who are ready to condemn her, he doesn't say, you know, it's okay, um, just, just, just go away and, and keep doing what you're doing. But he says, you know, go and sin no more. So he's telling her the truth as well. And that's a good model for us, too, that, that sin, it, God, obviously God takes sin seriously, right? And and so should we. But I think sometimes with, you know, as we go back to talk about progressive Christianity, we just forget that we are sinners. And when we lean into our desires, well, our desires are sinful. So uh, I, and and that's why I included that in there, because I think just to affirm that Jesus affirms yeah. at the yeah, creation and, narrative. And he was present at creation. Yeah. We've got to remember that, you know, as, as a member of the Trinity. Yeah, which is so fun to think about. Colossians 1, all things were created through him and for him. And we see in Genesis 1 that God is creating and we see the spirit of God is hovering over the earth. And if Jesus was there and then Jesus affirms it, um, it just it connects everything and it makes it I think it almost handcuffs us to the Bible where um, if we are going to if we are going to turn away from what this biblical um, biblical idea of gender and sexuality is, it's us who are falling away. It's not God who is changing. And I, I just think um, the consistency that you mentioned here in this point uh, is super important uh, for parents and youth workers to think about. Um, but we better keep moving here to number four. Yep. Lane Lane has a question here for number four. Number four says, human sin has corrupted everything, including sex and gender. So Lane, go ahead and ask Walt your question. Yeah, so um, under that point, the, one of the parts you say in there is Satan wants us to cooperate with him in the destruction of God's good order and design wherever that exists. And I think part of that is the world is telling our kids that God's design for sex and gender is repressive and cruel. So how can we help them understand that God's design is actually loving and good when that's what they're hearing from the world in that, you know, Satan's attempt to, um, you know, bring about that destruction of God's good order? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think uh, one of the helpful things we can do is we can have people tell their stories, you know, older people who have lived through this and struggled through this. And so, even as moms and dads, you know, just some some realistic, giving our kids a realistic picture of how things are, right? Um, so talking about marriage and talking about sexuality and talking about struggles and talking about the fact that love is not infatuation but uh, and a feeling, but love is really a decision. Marriage is a covenant, a commitment. That's why we do this in front of people. And so, and then also those who have those who have who have jumped into sin and those who have maybe been locked into sin for quite some time and who have come out of that and and found redemption for them to tell their stories to to give a testimony hey you know I went down this road let me tell you what it's like and here's why I believe that that God's good design and order is one that leads to human flourishing and Satan's desire to see us go against God's good design and order really left me quite undone and it's interesting now because I think even with the transgender movement, we're starting to hear, we're still kind of early into this, the way we understand it in our culture, but we're starting to hear more of those detransitioning stories where people are really being very straightforward about, you know, I bought a lie. I lived into a lie. And that's part of my fear for our kids because they believe, um, you know, they believe just anything. But this is where Tulane, I think— and, and this is where I'd say to youth workers, just like with Jess, we have to teach the doctrine of Scripture, right? We tether ourselves to these things. We have to teach the doctrine of sin. And, man, you know, the enemy is so cunning. What, one of the great things that you could do, uh, let me recommend two books. Um, one would be, of course, read with your students C.S. Lewis's, um, you know, uh, uh, man, I'm drawing a blank right now. Help me out, Kyle. Uh, the devils. Go shape uh, letters. The what? 
Screw tape letters. Screw tape letters. Why wasn't there I thinking that? Because I was thinking about the title of the second book. But to read Lewis's screw tape letters, which are instructions from a senior devil to a junior devil, man, that really gets to the heart. Because you're you're reading that, and you're going, oh yeah, I see that in me. Oh yeah, I see that in me. I see how that's exploited in me. So you know our sin sin nature. Man, I can't believe I forgot the title of a Lewis book. That's that's crazy. People call me. Don't worry, Walt. No, none of us are judging you. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. And then and then uh, Mark Jones has this newer book that just came out called Knowing Sin, which is a great doctrine, um, homardiology, Right. That's what we call it. Uh, the theology or like a theology of sin. Um, that book is really helpful too. And so he talks there about some of the specific ways that Satan tries to get under our, our skin and undo us and, and, and get us out of God's good design. So I think teaching that. And, and the other part of that I'd say is, unfortunately, one of the best teachers is experience. And, you know, man, when we mess up, um, you know, and sometimes we just have to watch our kids mess up. That's, that's, that's my story. That's your story. We've all done that. And so... Uh, you know, to realize that. I would also say, let's not make those false promises. I mentioned the purity movement earlier. Uh, part, one of the great errors of the purity movement was just wait, just wait, you know. And if you wait, A, you won't be, you know, used goods, which are only good to be thrown away, which was a horrible thing to teach to kids. But B, if you wait, uh, your sex life's going to be incredible. And And unfortunately, that doesn't take into account that not only are desires broken, but bodies are broken as well, and sometimes things just don't work as they are promised, and couples struggle. And and we're hearing a lot of those stories now of you know like kids who were in youth group when I was a youth pastor who are coming out and saying the purity movement made promises that just are false. Yeah, so uh, let's move on to number five, uh, which Jess has a question for Walt on. Number five says, God's will and way for gender is clear. So we live in a, in a world where things are very cloudy, right? Um, the way that things are described changes, uh, it, it seems even daily at times, especially as advertising happens. Uh, you might, like, I was sitting in my, uh, in my living room the other day and an advertisement came on. I was trying to think through what, what the message was, uh, was coming across. And, right, things can seem so cloudy when we think about uh, gender and sexuality, but Point five says God's will and way for gender is clear. So Jess, why don't you ask Walt your question? So when I was reading this uh, portion of the article, one student came to mind. Um, it's like a year and a half or a couple years ago. Uh, she came up to me saying, I know that I'm a girl, but I don't like the way that the world talks about girls. So I want to, so that's why she goes by they, them um, in her school setting. Mm. And so I thought that was an interesting um, statement that this young girl was able to articulate. So yeah, I was wondering how can we understand today's culture of like the separation between biological sex and gender expression and how to understand ger- gender stereotypes um, in today's world? Yeah, that's a good question, Jess. And I, I think, you know, what I would say right out of the gate and what I've tried to communicate here is what God has established. All right. So we say that. And by the way, it's a good thing that she says, I know that I'm a girl. I'll get to that second part in a second. But just a God... Uh, created male and female binary genders, and I think that's something we need to push on because one of the cultural messages is just on physicality, right? Because we're trying to, many people are trying to actually change that uh, biologically, you know, anatomically. Um, but we also need to say that there there is a there is a misconception based on some ways that people in the church have misunderstood male and female that, you know, the two roles are one of, you know, lording it over and dominant submission and the other to unquestioning submission. And I think we need to we need to double back and explain the difference between male and female as God designed them. They're both fully human, both fully equal in dignity. I say that in this, and also that biologically um, they're complementary. And so you know, you have to understand that and teach that as well. Now, the issue, the second issue that you brought up is how we, in our different cultures, understand that. And as Kyle said, man, it changes like week by week. And so that's where I think I would just sit and listen and say, well, what have you heard the culture say? You know, or what are your interests? Because a lot of times it might be a girl who she likes to do things that we've said boys typically like to do. 
And there's nothing wrong with that, you know? So, like, when I was a kid, kids, girls like that in their neighborhood were called tomboys. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I, But I do think that sometimes we try to push kids out of their interests, their desires, and their gifts. And, you know, there's a difference between letting them live into that and, and then allowing them or encouraging them to actually live out of what their actual gender as created by God is. And so... You know, I, I think that's what's that's what's really set in stone. I don't know if I've answered your question well or not, but, you know, I would ask lots of questions and just say, well, what do you think a girl is? And and I think you can affirm so many things um, in terms of interests that girls may have that aren't considered, quote, unquote, girly at the present time mm-hmm. in our culture. Yeah, when we had that conversation, it just brought up, um, yeah, it was a sweet connection point of, yeah, what does it look like? How do we understand how media tells us about who we should be or what we should do or where are we learning this from TikTok or from YouTube or from movies? And I think it was it was a good it was a good opportunity for me to challenge her to say, yeah, like God made you with your interests and you're with your desire or with your um, sports that you like or these kind of things. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it brought up really good conversation, but it wasn't a unique question I've never had before. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, keep watching as Kyle said, keep watching, you know, because I think there is an agenda there to really push our kids, uh, away from, uh, God's good understanding of gender. And so sometimes I think, uh, all, I, I would call them like alternative gender roles are thrown out there and kids are encouraged to live into that. To think that that is normal instead of starting with God's plan and then saying, building on that, you know, what are my interests? You know, this is, and, and like this girl you're talking about, what are my interests? What are my abilities? What are my, where's my giftedness? And there's really nothing wrong with that, you know, to pursue those things. Yes, I was wondering if you could just quickly uh, speak to any youth workers who are listening, who, um, if they find themselves in a situation that you did, they might be shocked. They might not know, like, what would you just in in two or three sentences, how would you encourage someone who thinks, I hope that never happens to me, but it probably will? Like what what encouragement would you give to someone like that? Um, I would encourage you that if yeah, if a student does open up to you, then obviously they trust you and they see that you're someone who they can talk to. Um, I think my often when if I've had these conversations with students, it's often I just start by thanking them for sharing with me. And just asking them questions and then uh, sometimes i'll say let's go for coffee in a week so i can have time to think about it and ponder um i think so often we can think that like i have to say this or we, i have to convince them in one conversation where these conversations are like a thousand conversations or over four years of time knowing that god is working and is sovereign over all of that um so i think that's brought me a lot of grace or a lot of peace and comfort as the walk along students who are walking and wrestling through this yeah, thanks for that encouragement, because I know that so often this can be something that uh, we, people can prepare for uh, with your children or even students in the youth group. But uh, at one point, you can't always prepare. So that was a good word. So this has been a conversation. Um, we're going to take a short break. And we just did the first half. Um, we did five points here on this resource that Walt wrote, God's Plan for Sex and Gender. And after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to ask him a few more questions on the following five, the last five points of this document. So uh, we'll be right back. If you enjoy listening to Youth Culture Matters and would like to support the ongoing efforts of this ministry, you can do so by visiting cpyu.org giving to make a donation. Your prayers and financial support make this podcast possible. And we're back on this episode of Youth Culture Matters as we're looking at uh, the resource that Walt wrote, God's Plan for Sex and Gender. And before the break, we looked at numbers one to five, and now we're going to look at six to ten um, of this resource that is helpful. Um, I would just recommend it as a youth pastor to youth workers, to parents, uh, even to grandparents as they try to navigate what um, culture their grandkids are growing up in that is different from the culture that they grew up in. Uh, just a lot of good resources, um, and I would put this in their hands. So let's uh, start this discussion. Lane is going to ask a question on number six to Walt, and number 6.6 6 is God's design for sex and marriage is clear. God's design for sex and marriage is clear. So Lane, why don't you ask Walt your question? 
So yeah, in this point, Walt, um, you say really clearly, marriage is the place for sex. And you talk a little bit about the purpose for sex in this brief paragraph, and not to be overly simplistic, but why? That's my question. Why is the, is marriage the place for sex? Yeah, and one of the reasons why this point is so important is because most people don't understand either the place or the purpose for sex. And so, you know, we, we've had people on the uh, podcast before. We've talked about, um, you know, the sexual realities on the college campus and the hookup culture where it's all about me and it's all about personal pleasure and it's purely something physical we don't exchange names. There's no emotional ties. I mean, it is totally lifted out of what God's design was. And that's where I think we need to be really clear. So the place is in a uh, covenantal. I mean, there's a promise that's made, right? And all this is so countercultural to how we live today. Uh, covenantal, lifelong, monogamous. We become one flesh. It's a heterosexual union between one man and one woman, and it's and, and and sex is to be experienced only within the context of marriage between one man and one woman. Marriage is a place for sex, but there's and the reason for this is it dovetails with God's purpose for this, and God's given it to us at multiple levels. One is you know to consummate and seal the marriage to to become one flesh. This is what God has given us to make that happen. You know the act of sexual intercourse is for that between a man and a woman. It's also a gift to us to foster mutual intimacy between a husband and a wife, between a man and a woman. And and then it's, you know, we, we can't discount what the culture says is really what sexuality is all about. It, it's pleasurable. God made it to be that way. So it enables mutual pleasure. And it's also a way to be uh, obedient to God's command at creation to be fruitful and multiply, right? To fill the earth, pro- procreation. And, and I'd also add, you know, when we get into the New Testament, we see, as Paul says, that marriage uh, is a mystery as it represents, you know, um, Christ's relationship with his bride. And so I, I, I would guarantee you everyone who's in a Christian marriage would affirm <laughs> it's a mystery, right? Um, <laughs> you know, and you pretty much that happens like two or three days after you you, you get married, you start to realize, yeah, this is a mystery and it's, it's going to be. So, you know, one of the points I make here is that, and it's clear, and Christopher Yuan has talked about this. We've had him on the podcast before, uh, but he says, you know, his simple phrase is, God calls us to chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. Anything outside of that is outside of God's design. It's sin. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Walt, because I think that as you just say that about sin, I think one thing that, as we talked about before the last break we just had, is that because things are so cloudy, the reason things are so cloudy is because of sin. And if it's clear, um, as point six says, if God's design for sex and marriage is clear, we have to have a clear understanding of sin to have a clear understanding of the way that God wants us to live. Um, so we'll move together. We'll move ahead to uh, number seven that says God recognizes that we all struggle at some level with sex and gender. God recognizes that we all struggle at some level with sex and gender. And well, my question for you here with this one, you you make a statement in here uh, that God makes it clear that any form of sexual immorality, and then you you list a few of them, is sinful outside of God's plan and harmful to one's self and others. Um, but as we think about this, and as we think about um, just that all people are struggling, uh, one thing that I think um, our our culture and even church culture can highly lack is just having a problem with people in process. So can you speak to parents and youth workers about how they can see their kids who are struggling with this stuff as being children in process yeah. and maybe helping them look at the long game rather than just where their kids are at now? Yeah, and that's a good question, Kyle, because I, I you know, I was not thinking of that when I wrote that, I was more thinking of uh, the fact that we, as I said earlier, we categorize sin. We put sin at different Mm. levels. So we diminish certain sexual sins and we see others as worse. And certainly in today's world, you know, the whole gender and same-sex attraction, you know, transgender thing, we've kind of elevated them. And and I really wanted everyone to see that this is a struggle for us all. We all have, we're all broken by sin and we all have broken desires. That said, your point is important that we have to have patience. You know, our kids are in the process uh, developmentally of trying to figure out their identity, and the culture is throwing all sorts of new stuff and options at them 
that you know they can choose to to try to live into and we see that happening right with uh, the identity struggle and then also uh, a secondary uh, a secondary developmental task that's pr- that's primary as well the second one would be that of worldview formation trying to figure out what it is I believe and again with so many options that are out there and kids immersed in this 24/7 catechesis of uh, on sexuality and gender that's being given to them by the culture they're going to consider these things and so we need to be patient and you know I, I often think then in the midst of our patience, we need to lean into this like Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Mm -hmm. Where he would use this formula where he was trying to change the narrative for people or get them to see what was true. And he would say something like, you have heard it said that, and and he would lay out, you know, what the reality was that they'd come to believe. But I tell you, and this is where I think in our patience, we can use that um, sort of formula that, that Jesus gives us and, and just say to them, you know, here's another way of looking at it. As you're considering all these different options, here's another way of looking at it. And give them scriptural truth and trust God's Spirit to bring that promised return on that. Just keep speaking truth. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And I think that um, we need to remember that repetition does help. You know, sometimes I think that uh, they say that when, when you feel like you've said it too much, you're just saying it enough. Um, in like a sales pitch or like as a teacher. Uh, But when we think about this, like we're reminding our students and our children um, about some of the most important and foundational truth of all time. And so repetition is okay. And that's why I'm glad you said that, um, how you did. And so now we're going to move to number six, which uh, you kind of make a little shift here out of the 10 that you have listed here. So seven, the one we just did, God recognizes that we all struggle at some level with sex and gender. Number eight shifts slightly where it says God uses our sex and gender struggles for his glory and our good. Um, So it is not only that we do struggle, but in the midst of the struggles, God is up to something, right? He's not absent. He's not turning his face from our struggles. Um, but what he's actually doing is he's number eight. He uses our sex and gender struggles for his glory and our good. And Jess has a question for you on that one. So for this one, I was thinking of um, so often, yeah, we all do as we're walking with sin and struggling through um, struggling through life sometimes. We can feel the weight and, and the difficulty of navigating our desires and judging our feelings with scripture or judging yeah, what you said earlier in the podcast. Um, and so I just was wondering of if you have practical advice of how to walk alongside a student who is just feeling the weight and the burden and the difficulty of pursuing a holy life in the midst of this conversation. Yeah, I, that's a great question, Jess. And I, I think of two things immediately that we need to teach them. Uh, one is to see the lie of the enemy, right, to get us to, to think, did God really say? And the lie of the enemy gets us to lean more into our, our feelings, right? And so, um, you know, we, we see, sometimes we see these struggles as punishment. Sometimes, you know, what did I do wrong to deserve this? Why isn't God releasing me from this? That whole thing. So I think to see that, but also then to um, to get them to see the truths of what Scripture speaks really from the fall on uh, about suffering, that God um, uses suffering and struggle for our for our, our uh, His glory and our good, and and that's where, man, I I just think we have been so backwards in the church. We bought into the quote unquote American dream or some sort of strange kind of Christianity that it's all about feeling good, you know, uh, avoiding pain, a pain and pursuing pleasure, which we all want to do, right? That's our basic human desire. Nobody says, no, if I have an option, I sign up for pain. Uh, but but that's what life often gives us. And this is where, you know, the, the psalmist says, uh, my suffering was good for me because it led me to lean into your decrees, mm. to trust your word, to lean into your law. And when you read, if you read from Genesis to Revelation with suffering in the front of your mind, it is amazing how much of the scriptures are really about that. And and we should expect suffering because that's part of the curse, right? Um, you know, the fall. So, you know, this is where I think if we teach them, here's the lie the culture's uh, teaching, and here's how suffering can be redemptive— 
that'll become real as they struggle. And I say that from a first-person perspective uh, because I've had relational breakdown. I've had physical breakdown, um, you know, other breakdowns as well that have been, you know, that's been suffering, not not as we would define it here, you know, in terms of sexuality and gender, um, you know, with desires that just don't go away. But uh, I've understood how God uses suffering, and it's not until you go through it. And a- anyone that I've talked to who has gone through severe difficulty, uh, including people who have gone through stuff with sexuality and gender and come out on the other side trusting God and his word, they would say, I wouldn't trade the suffering for anything because of what God taught me in the midst of it. He formed me a- as a human being more into Him, into his image. So I think it's setting them up kind of on the starting line for what this journey is going to be like and keep reminding them that. And as you said, you know, walk along with them. Yeah. And well, as you said that, it just reminds me how uh, God can, you know, when we think about Ephesians 2.10, uh, that we are his we are His workmanship uh, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God cre- uh, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, I just think that so many times we can think, I heard someone say one time, that like, it's almost like we have this idea that when suffering happens or when, you know, we think about, you know, struggles with sexuality and gender happen, um, that like God, the God, the father says to God, the son, like, why'd you screw this one up? Right. And like, that's not what's happening. Right. God is using suffering uh, to to Ephesians 2.10 to continue to create his masterpiece that he has uh, within us. The word there in Greek is poema, which is where we get the word poem. We are his poem that he's writing. And it actually, this actually ties in real well. Jess has a question for number nine. Um, but again, I, just to those who are listening, uh, this document that Walt wrote, uh, uh, I'll say it for him rather than him having to say about his own, but like we see here, these points are building on each other. And if you're looking for something to teach your students or to have conversations at home, um, we know, I talked to a dad this morning who last night was doing a Bible study with all four of his kids and it ended with all four of his kids. They're all teenagers or about to be teenagers. They were all crying. Like, like we know that like these conversations uh, don't always go the way we have planned. But one nice thing about this document is these 10 points are very um are very succinct and they all build on each other. Um, so we're going to go from eight um, that we just talked about, which um, pointed us about um, how God uses things for his glory and our good to number nine that says God is with us and there is help for you when you struggle with sex and gender. God is with us and there is help for you when you struggle with sex and gender. So Jess has another question for Walt on that one. Yeah, so similarly to the last one, how do how can we walk alongside students who don't feel like God is with them or he's not answering their prayers or they've been seeking for him and seeking for help, but they're just not um, yet yeah, not feeling his presence? How can we encourage them in that time? Yeah, I would go back to what I said before, just about teaching them that in the midst of our suffering, God is with us and God is at work. And sometimes there is that, uh, you know, that old dark night of the soul where we feel that God has abandoned us, but God is actually doing great work in the midst of that. One way to walk alongside kids with that is those of us who are older, who have been through more, who are maybe wiser, no matter what kind of a struggle or suffering it might be, is to speak to them out of our experience. And as we communicate our experience, say, here's how I've seen this particular word of God. And, you know, going back to the scriptures, the things that have been helpful to you, this is how I've seen this to be true. I in this little section here, and these are just short paragraphs, right? But I went back to uh, Romans 7, where, you know, Paul just struggled, 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 struggled. And he talked about how, you know, the Lord, even though he asked him to take it away, uh, it was still there, right? So for some reason, it's there. And the struggle was so great, he cries out, you know, what a wretched man that I am. That's his struggle with sin. But he also knows clearly you know, who to run to, where to run as he struggles with sin. And he asks this question, and it's beautiful because he answers it, right? He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he just doesn't leave us hanging. He, he goes on to say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this takes time. And this is where I think, like you said, how do we walk with him? The question is actually, your question is actually the answer, you know, that we do walk with them. We don't abandon them. We stay with them. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, 
you know, remember how Moses needed his arms to be held up. Uh, sometimes we come alongside and we need to hold the arms up of our kids, you know, when they start to get start to get weak. And, and I think, too, just to teach them, preach the gospel to yourself, preach the gospel to yourself. I wish I knew that when I, or I had known that when I was a teenager and a college student. You know, now I'm older and I've got these years and I realize, man, that, I see how that works. So, um, yeah, just talk about God's presence, carrying the burden. You know, Jesus talking about the yoke. I mean, we, we, we teach here on anxiety and just how we need to bring our fear and our anxiety to the Lord. And he's taken them upon himself on the cross and has given us victory over those things. Uh, you know, just reminding our kids of that. It sounds so cliche-ish, but I do believe the Holy Spirit uses that. Well, and have you found, talking about cliches, just uh, for those who are listening who might say, you know, if I try to talk about this stuff with my kids, I'm probably going to stumble over my words. Or if I try to talk about this kids, like with my kids, they're going to hear the cliches that I don't even like, like, how would you, Walt, encourage parents even just to make a first step to have these conversations with their kids? Yeah, well, you are going to stumble over your words. I mean, I think we always do, right? Whenever we get questions on this, because people stumbled over their words when they when they talked about this with us, if they had words, right? If we had the conversation, because some of us didn't have it. So I, I would just say, you know, get over your, your kids are thinking about this. This is part of how they've been made. And I think a big part of this is to approach it as sex is not a dirty thing, as so many of us have been raised to think, you know, or, or according to the Bible and God, sex is, a, you know, God is anti-sex and sex is a dirty thing. No, God pronounced it good. And, you know, I'll, I'll use a cliche, Kyle, since you asked that. So, so many times when we talk about sex and sexuality, we start and finish with what, quote unquote, God is against. And what we need to talk about is what God is for. And that's what this document, I'm trying to communicate this, that we start with God's good plan. So if we can see it as such and communicate it in that way, I think our kids are going to are going to understand that. And and they'll understand if we have fear about speaking about it too. So, you know, be bold. Um, yeah, thanks for that word because I think uh you know, it goes back to even as we think about uh, you know, the here's another cliche like when was the best time to plant an apple tree? And they say, well, you know, you know, 10 a couple decades ago, but when's the second best time today? Yeah. And so for parents who are listening, who are just trying to think like, I don't even know where to start these conversations. Well, like may- maybe, maybe it's just having one conversation or maybe it's asking questions where the answer that their kids are asking are going to point in this direction. Yeah, You know, Kyle, um, look, I, the, the earlier you start to have the conversation, the easier it is. The yeah. longer you wait, the more difficult it gets because we tend to procrastinate. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's important. And the other thing is look for the opportunities the culture yep. gives you. It yep. Just you guys have mentioned commercials, TV shows, films, books, whatever it is, the Internet stuff's going to come up. And and uh, when we're sitting with our kids and that happens, talk about it. Say, hey, look at that. What did you think about that? Or, yeah. you know, there's the you have heard it said that. Here's another way of looking at it. Just use those teachable moments very naturally. Yeah, that's a good word, because like you said, we don't have to look too far. Nope. Right. Uh, turn the TV on and uh, see what happens. Uh, <laughs> there's some some uh, fun advice. So here we are. We made it to point number 10. And Lane has a question for point number 10. And one thing I um, appreciate about Lane as she um, is going to ask us her question is uh, as she's a mom and she's got uh, she's got uh, several kids of her own. But then she's also a youth worker where she volunteers her time at her church with the youth group. Um, so, uh, just to keep that in mind, as she asked this last question, point number 10 is God provides hope as we wait for our struggles to end. So that's God provides hope as we wait for our struggles to end. So Lane, why don't you ask Walt, uh, your last question here? So I love that we're ending with hope here. I love that we start with God's good design and we're ending with hope. That makes me really happy. Um, so my question is maybe just more something I'd like you to talk about. Um, when it becomes personal for our kids, when it's one of their friends or a relative or a fellow youth group kid um, who's sharing something with them that they're struggling with, it's tough for our kids. They love their friend, but they love Jesus too. Uh, They want to be faithful to God. Um, They want to recognize that we're all sinners. They want to hold out the gospel to their friends. 
um, it gets really complicated. It gets really heavy for our kids. So I guess just talk a little bit about that hope that we have, you know, as we go through these struggles and that, you know, we can share with our kids and hopefully they can share as they encounter a lot of these struggles. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it, the Bible ends with this. And when we get to the last couple chapters of Revelation, we see, and again, I'll, I'll go back to, I know, Kyle, over the course of the summer, your Warden Youth Ministry podcast, uh, you do, you're doing a four-part series, and the last episode, I believe, will be on this, you know, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, what we have to look forward to when all the brokenness, all the disordered desires, all that will be, everything will be renewed, and we will be healed of these things. No more pain, no more disease, no more struggle. That's our hope. Now, for a kid, that seems like an eternity away. Eternity seems like an eternity away. For an adult, and I will confess as I get older, it doesn't seem that far away. I start, I start to wish, you know, it, with lifespan, that maybe it'll go a little longer <laughs> than it probably will for me. That's just, I'm realizing that reality now as I get older. But life, the Scriptures tells us, is so brief. It's like the wind or the grass that just sprouts up and you know, and then dies the next day. And I think, you know, it's just teaching patience and being patient with people and and walking alongside them. I, I think, you know, one of the guys who's really helped me with this in terms of uh, sexual sin, who's really taught a lot about discipleship and self-denial is Wesley Hill, who is same-sex attracted, who wrote a book called Washed and Waiting. And isn't that the story of all of us, regardless of what our particular issue is? Rosaria Butterfield talks about the fact that, you know, her same-sex attraction, that was her thing. And everybody has their thing. And whether it's related to sexuality and gender or not, uh, God is with us, as we've said, and, and we await that day when all things will be made new, and we encourage and lift each other up and carry each other. This is what our kids can learn to do in— um, youth group or with our friends, you know, the community, the body of Christ, we we carry each other and we support each other in the midst of our struggles, holding each other accountable and encouraging each other uh, as we live this difficult life that requires sacrifice and self-denial. That is the Christian life, right? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So anything we can we can do to encourage our kids, to encourage each other, and to encourage them to live in the now but not yet fully realized kingdom of God, which means in this still broken world, right, we still struggle with sin, we are called to live back into God's original design that will be restored and be even better at the consummation of all things that we read about in, in Revelation. So, yeah, we can't deny the struggle. It's, it's there. I mean, we're told we're going to have it. Paul certainly talks about it. Jesus does as well. And we are called to live into the sufferings of Christ, and we need to consider that a gift. I was thinking, as Kyle was talking before on one of those last points, that the fact that we struggle, the fact that this is difficult for us, is a sign uh, that God is working in our lives to bring about his uh, His good um, results in terms of what he knows we need. It's a good yeah. question. Yeah, and I think, uh, Lane, to your point, when we think about hope, you know, when we think about biblical counseling, one thing we always want to be giving people is hope. We all, because because God, our God is a God of hope, right? Because if Jesus would have stayed dead, if he would have stayed in the tomb, like every other religious leader who lived and died, um, we wouldn't have hope. But because Jesus rose from the dead, we can have hope. And we, when we think about how this is titled, this resource, God's plan for sex and gender, we know no matter where our students or children may find themselves, there is always hope. Um, and one time someone told me there's, there's, um, you can't be any more lost than lost to God. Like God loves all lost people. And um, I think it's an encouragement. So what would you have any last, uh, last thoughts for our listeners um, or encouragements for them as we, uh, as we wrap this episode up? Yeah, I don't think this is easy. Um, I think it's complex. I think the culture is changing quickly. You know, some of the questions you folks have asked, they're difficult questions, and there are even some questions we pondered that we didn't ask on this podcast that require, uh, you know, mu much more time to try to dig in because they are so complex. But but at the same time, God's given us uh, God's given us His His design, and we need to 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 you know get that stake driven into the ground and and tethered to it because the winds of the times, the culture, 
are really, really pushing us away. And, and more than anything else, what God did say, you know, we started with this, Kyle, in the beginning, God, right? What God did establish is his design and his order. The enemy is the questions we get. That, that That's the enemy whispering in our ear to getting us to question, did God really say that, you know, and, and trying to wreck us on this. So just be patient, be diligent. It's not easy. Uh, but God's with us in the midst of this. I do want to mention as well, Kyle, that um, we, on this handout there, that, which people can download at cpyu.org, there is a list of additional resources that we found to be very, very helpful here. Uh, we've just scratched the surface here. This is a yeah. start, and I say in this handout, this is not exhaustive. It's just a start, yeah. just things you've got to hit. Yeah, so we would just suggest our listeners to uh, go to cpyu.org and download this. Uh, Lane and Jess, thank you for joining us, uh, joining Walt and I today uh, for this conversation as we've talked about this resource, God's Plan for Sex and Gender. And I just want to end by uh, by reading the quote that's on the, on the first page. It's from uh, the third paragraph, but it says, as parents and youth workers, we must use our voices to teach our children and teens what God really did say if we hope to help them find their way through the cultural narrative's lies on sex and gender. So I think that kind of summarizes where we've been in this in this episode. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Youth Culture Matters and we'll be we'll be back next time. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.